Okay, so we'll, we'll resume the workshop, the third talk of today. Uh, we have Stefan Riner uh, talking about a problem for Chalmers, two-dimensional semantics. Thank you, Stefan. Yes, uh, thank you. So um, welcome to my talk uh, with the title Indexicals, a problem for Chalmers, two-dimensional semantics. Um, so in the last 20, 20 years, bit more now, years, Chalmers has argued for the following two-dimensional semantics. So, ah, so first, every expression or thought token of the sort that is a candidate to have an extension is associated with both a primary and a secondary intention. Primary intention is function from scenarios, epistemically possible worlds to extensions, and a secondary intention is a function from metaphysically possible worlds to extension. Second, when the extension of a complex expression or thought token depends compositional, compositionally on the extension of its parts, then the same is true for its primary and its secondary intention. Yeah, so they depend compositionally on the primary and second in, uh, secondary intention respectively of its parts. And third, the extension of an expression of thought token coincides with the value of its primary intention at the scenario of utterance and with the value of its secondary intention at the world of utterance. And finally, we have a sentence or thought token. S is metaphysically necessary if the secondary intention of the sentence is true at all worlds. And a sentence or thought token is epistemically necessary if the primary intention of the sentence is true at all scenarios. And this is what I will call Chalmers two-dimensional semantics. For now, I assume that scenarios are just possible worlds and that the scenario of utterance is simply is the world of utterance. Yeah? Uh, so for example, if for all A knows at the time T, it could turn out that the possible world uh, is actual, then for all A knows, um, this world is an epistemic possibility. Yeah? More generally, we can say that a possible world is epistemically possible if and only if it cannot be ruled out a priori um, that is independent of experience that the world is actu actual, yeah, that it's our actual world. And then accordingly, a sentence of thought token S is epistemically necessary if S is a priori. Yeah. So epistemic necessity then um, is just the same as a priority. And in this talk, um, as the title suggests, I will present a problem for Chalmers two-dimensional semantics when it comes to indexicals. First, I will argue with Chalmers that in connection with indexicals, his two-dimensional semantics leads to the problem of how scenarios could best represent the information who I, the speaker, am, where I am, and what time it is now. And this is the problem of indexicality. This is a problem that Chalmers is, is aware of. For Chalmers, then the natural solution to this problem is to identify scenarios with centered worlds, yeah? ordered tuples of worlds, individuals, times, and places, and with the individual, the time, and the place um, being the center of, the, of any given scenario. And against this, I will object that there are um, a posteriori true that is epistemically contingent utterances of sentences like now is now and here is here. And this is what I would call the problem of a posteriori truths. And I will argue that as, um, that as long as Chalmers two-dimensional semantics entails compositionality, which is here T2, which is something that Chalmers doesn't want uh, to give up, the centered false account um, does not provide a solution to the problem of a posteriori truths. That, that is, it cannot explain that there are a posterior true utterances of now is now and here is here. And since identifying scenarios with centered worlds seems to be the natural solution of the problem of indexicality, um, this will undermine Chalmers two dimensional semantics. The talk is structured as follows. In section one, I will present the problem of indexicality and Chalmers solution to the problem, which is to identify scenarios with centered worlds. In section two, I will then um, briefly discuss a posteriori true identity statements in connection with proper names, such as Hesperus and Phosphorus. And I will argue that this is a corollary of Chalmers two-dimensional semantics, that if an idealized speaker, that is a speaker without any cognitive limitations, cannot rule out a priori, that is by reasoning alone, that the sentence of thought token S is false, 
then S is a posteriori true if true. And then starting from this in section three, I will argue that in addition to a posteriori true utterances of identity statements with proper names, there are also a posteriori true utterances of now is now and here is here. And then since the centered world's account cannot explain this, uh, an advocate of Chalmers two-dimensional semantics will have to come up with an alternative candidate for scenarios which provides both a solution to the problem of indexicality and a solution to the problem of a posteriori truths. And as I said, this does not seem to me uh, to be an easy task. Concluding in section four, uh, the problem will be further exacerbated in the context of biconditional faults using Lee Bakuri and Hawthorne's mirror man example. So that's the plan. So let's start with the problem of indexicality. So what are primary intentions? Roughly speaking, the primary intention of an expression or thought token E assigns to a scenario S the extension an idealized speaker with the right sort of information about S would assign to E under the hypothesis that S is actual. Yeah, so if you tell a speaker this is, this is your world, uh, an idealized speaker, and he has all the right sort of information about this world, then he would give you the, the referent he would pick out for a thought token or expression token, and this uh, is what the primary intention picks out with respect to this scenario. And this is what I call PI. So for example, if S is a scenario where Neptune is the brightest star in the evening, then under the hypothesis that S is actual, an idealized speaker with the right sort of information about S would assign Neptune to a token of Hesperus and not Venus. Yeah. And this is why, according to Chalmers, primary intention incorporates many of the properties that traditionally have been associated with Reagan senses, such as determination of reference, compositionality, cognitive significance, and so on. However, Chalmers also notes that if scenarios are centered to, are nothing other than possible words, then in connection with indexicals, BI leads to the following problem. And this is the problem of indexicality. A full description of a possible world might leave open who I am, where I am, and what time it is now. Therefore, even an idealized speaker with a full description of this world uh, might lack the right information to determine the extension of a token of I here or now um, under the hypothesis that this world is actual. Yeah. For this, it seems that the speaker needs some locating information, yeah, a marker indicating which individual he, he is, where he is, and what time it is. And the question how to best represent this information is what, what I call the problem of indexicality. And the solution to the problem of indexicality cannot simply be that an that at an arbitrary scenario S, the primary intention of a token R of now picks out the time of utterance of R in S. Yeah. Why? Well, according to such a solution, R, R or at least some token of now would have to exist at the scenario, in every scenario. Um, however, since it can neither be known a priori that R exists nor that some token of now exists, um, there are scenarios in which no token of now exists, which is why Chalmers does not uh, like this um, kind of solution to the problem of indexicality. According to Chalmers, the natural solution to the problem uh, is uh, to identify scenarios with centered worlds, ordered tuples of worlds, individuals, times, and places, with the individual, the time, and the place being the center of the world. Such a solution has the advantage that two arbitrary tokens of now, here, and I, respectively, have the same primary intention. Uh, the primary intention of now, picking out the time at the market at the center of any given scenario, the primary intention of here, picking out the place marked at the center of any given scenario, and the primary intention of I, picking out the individual market at the center of any given scenario. However, at the cost that the primary intention of an indexed sentence, such as, it is now Saturday, no longer has an absolute truth value, but instead is true or false only with respect to a subject, a time, and a place. Yeah. So this is then a deviation from the classical Phrygian uh, theory. Another corollary of the centered world's account is that an utterance of now is now, or here is here, is a priori true if true. After all, according to the Centered Worlds account, two arbitrary tokens of now and here, respectively, have the same primary intention, picking out the place 
time mark the center of any given scenarios. And against this, I will object that there are a posteriori true utterance of now is now and here is here. Um, but first, I will briefly discuss a posteriori true identity statements in connection with um, proper names. So the classic examples uh, of a posteriori true identity statements is Hesperus and Phosphorus, so at least with proper names. And one of the main reasons for Chalmers to advocate a two-dimensional semantics is to explain how there can be sentences and thought tokens that are both metaphysically necessary without being epistemically necessary. Yeah. And a well-known example um, are identity statements with proper names such as Hesperus and Phosphorus. And since proper names are metaphysically rigid, their extension does not vary across metaphysically possible worlds, and utterance of Hesperus and Phosphorus is metaphysically necessary. However, prima facie, such an utterance is not epistemically necessary. You know, after all, even an idealized speaker cannot know a priori that an utterance of Hesperus and Phosphorus is true. The explanation for this cannot simply be that ordinary names such as Hesperus and Phosphorus are both metaphysically and epistemically rigid, and that apostolic true identity statements such as Hesperus and Phosphorus simply show that there are epistemically possible worlds that are not metaphysically possible. Even if there were epistemically possible worlds that are not metaphysically possible, it would not be an epistemic possibility that Hesperus is not identical with itself. Therefore, for Chalmers, the explanation of such examples has to be that although ordinary names such as Hesperus and Phosphorus are metaphysically rigid, they are not epistemically rigid. Yeah. And this is where two-dimensional semantics enters the scene. Although the secondary intention of, Hespero, of a Hesperus token picks out Venus in every metaphysically possible world, in which Venus exists at least, its primary intention does not pick out Venus in every scenario in which Venus exists. As said above, the primary intention of the expression token E assigns to a scenario as the extension an idealized speaker with the right sort of information about the scenario would assign to the expression or expression token under the hypothesis that this scenario is actual. So for example, if S is a scenario where Neptune is the brightest star in the evening, then under the hypothesis that the scenario is actual, an idealized speaker with the right sort of information about the scenario would assign Neptune to a token of Hesperus and not Venus. Yeah. So you already see it's not epistemically rigid. Similarly, if S is a scenario where Jupiter is the brightest star in the morning, then under the hypothesis that S is actual, an idealized speaker with the right sort of information about S would assign Jupiter to a token of Phosphorus and not Venus. So again, the term is not rigid in Chalmers' terms. And since we cannot rule out a priori that the scenario where the brightest star in the evening is not the brightest star, in the morning is actual, it follows that although an utterance of Hesperus or Phosphorus has a necessary secondary intention, its primary intention is contingent. Yeah. So that's the main reason uh, for Chalmers, or one of the main reasons to advocate or to argue for a two-dimensional semantics. So the reason why most philosophers believe that an utterance of Hesperus or Phosphorus is a posteriori true is that even an idealized speaker cannot rule out a priori that such an utterance is false. To this, most philosophers would accept the following principle, at least philosophers such as Chalmers. If an idealized speaker cannot rule out a priori that the sentence of thought token S is false, then S is a posteriori true if true. So there are philosophers who would deny this principle, for example, um, some neurocelians would deny this principle. So they would not accept that. Uh, they would say, well, an idealized speaker cannot rule out a priori that um, Hesperus is phosphorus is false. However, it is, they would not say that it's uh, that it's um, a posteriori. Yeah. So they would say that the proposition expressed by the sentence is a priori true. So for someone like Chalmers um, to argue that um, a sentence like Hesperus is Phosphorus is both metaphysically necessary but epistemically contingent, um, he has to advocate something like this, yeah, something like AP. And indeed, AP is a corollary of Chalmers' two-dimensional semantics. Um, if an idealized speaker cannot rule out a priori that the sentence of thought token S is false, as the antecedent of AP says, then there is a scenario such that the sentence is false in the scenario. That is, an idealized speaker would not assign the truth to S under the hypothesis that S is actual. And since, according to PI, this is tantamount to saying that there is a scenario such that the primary intention of the sentence is not true at the scenario, 
it would follow that together with T5 that S is, epis is epistemically contingent a posteriori true if true, as the consequence of AP says. So AP is indeed a corollary of Chalmers two-dimensional semantics. And next, I will argue that there are true utterances of now it's now, and here is here, such that even an idealized speaker cannot rule out a priori that they are false. Together with AP, it will follow that there are a posteriori true utterances of both now is now and here is here. So this is why we looked at the example with um, proper names to get to AP. So the example is... Uh, goes as follows. Let us assume that Mary, an idealized speaker, sits in a fake time machine. So here we have uh, an example of a model of the DeLorean from Back to the Future. So assume that she believes it's, it works. Yeah. Let us assume that Mary sits in a fake time machine, but that she erroneously believes that the time machine she's sitting in is real. Then we can think of an utterance of now is now, where Mary produces a token of now at a time t, pushes the start button of the fake time machine, and since nothing happens, produce the token of is now at t again. In this case, Mary certainly cannot rule out a priori that her utterance um, of now is now is false. And together with AP, it follows that her utterance is a posteriori true. And prima facie, the centered world's account cannot explain this. After all, according to the centered world's account, two arbitrary tokens of now have the pri same primary int intention, yeah? picking out the time marked at the center of the scenario. This is the problem of a posteriori true. And the problem also arises with here. For example, Mary could uh, be in a fake teleportation machine and erroneously believe that she sits in a real one. In such a case, we can think of an utterance of here is here, where Mary produces a token of here at a place P, pushes the start button of the fake teleportation machine, and since nothing happens, produces a token of is here at P. Again, Mary could not rule out a priori that her utterance is false. Together with AP, it would follow that it is a posteriori true if true. So the solution to the problem of a posteriori truths cannot simply be that Mary produced the two tokens of now, for example, at different times, and that therefore Mary's utterance of now is now is not true but false. Such a solution presupposes that Mary used her tokens of now to refer to very short periods of time. However, now can be used to refer to time periods of different length. Yeah. For instance, with an utterance of now it is raining in Stockholm, speakers usually refer to a much longer time period than with an utterance of now he has finally passed the ball well, watching a football game. Since in our example, Mary has the intention to say something true um, with her utterance of now is now, it is plausible to assume that she intends her use of now to refer to a somewhat longer period of time resulting in a true utterance of now is now. And it is also very unclear how such a solution could be extended to a posteriori true utterance of here is here. In that case, the two tokens of here are certainly produced at the same place. Yeah. Moreover, a problem similar to the problem of a posteriori truths also arises for false utterance of now is now and here is here. If two arbitrary tokens of now and here respectively have the same primary intention, picking out the time, place, marked at the center of any given scenario, then an utterance of now is now or here is here should always be true at the scenario of utterance. So again, this shows that the solution cannot simply be to say that the two tokens of now refer to different time points because even explaining that, they, that she said something false is already difficult for two-dimensional semantics. For an advocate of a centered world's account, the solution of the, to the problem of a posteriori truths also cannot be to argue that the possibility of time traveling can ultimately be ruled out a priori. Even if the possibility of time traveling could be ruled out a priori, it would not be trivial to rule out this possibility. Hence, it would not be trivial for Mary to rule out the possibility that her utterance of now is now is false. Again, it seems that the centered world's account cannot explain this at least not in its current form. If two arbitrary tokens of now have the same primary intention, picking out the time marked the center of any given scenario, then it should not be a problem for Mary to rule out the possibility that her utterance of now is now is false. Yeah. So the problem is not even that uh, between a priority or a posteriority. Yeah. It seems, therefore, that an advocate of the centered world's account is forced to maintain that in the case of an a posteriori true utterance of now is now, the two tokens of now have different primary intentions. 
Accordingly, the center of the scenario of utterance contains two time points. One time point corresponding to the time of utterance of the first token of now, and one time point corresponding to the time of utterance of the second token of now. Since there are scenarios where the two time points differ, the solution goes, there are scenarios where the primary intention of Mary's utterance of now is now comes out false. Yeah? However, it is very unclear how this could be compatible with a centered worlds account. If scenarios are centered worlds, then there has to be a time marked at the center of any given scenario, providing the information what time it is now. This was the reason we introduced them. Yeah. Since it should be expected that the primary intention of a token of now picks out the time, providing exactly this information, the centered worlds account seems to be committed to the claim that two arbitrary tokens of now have the same primary intention. Yeah. Picking out the time marked at the center of, the, uh, of any given scenario this is what now does. An advocate of the Standard Worlds account could respond that the, and this is um, what uh, Chalmers suggested to me uh, via email um, as a solution to the, to the problem. He says that he could account uh, or that uh, Mary's utterance is, is a posterior to by saying something like uh, that the primary intention of Mary's utterance of now is now is acting to the primary intention of now is then. According to such a solution, after Mary pushes the start button of the fake time machine, she makes an empirical discovery, which according to Chalmers, acts to a now is then fault. Yeah. And since this is the fault Mary wants to express with her utterance, the explanation goes, some kind of re-evaluation of the first token of now takes place after Mary completes her utterance. Yeah. So the first token of now is re-evaluated re to to the prime intention of, to, to correspond to the prime intention of 10. <laughs> However, again, it's very unclear what it means for a token to be re-evaluated um, and whether re-evaluation is compatible with compositionality. And Chalmers uh, said to me that he doesn't want to give up compositionality. So um, it has to be somehow compatible with it. But the main problem with this kind of solution is that um, re-evaluation is less plausible if we look at the following exacerbation of the problem of a posteriori truths. What the example of Mary really shows is that even a speaker who utters now is now, not in a fake teleportation, or not in a fake time machine, but just like this, um, has to rule out the possibility that they sit in a real time machine in order to know that their utterance is true. And since this possibility can only be ruled out by experience, or at least uh, it's not trivial to rule it out, the example of Mary not only shows that there are a posteriori true utterance of now is now, but that every true utterance of now is now is a posteriori true. But then, if every true utterance of now is now is a posteriori true, then advocate of the centered world's account seems to be committed to the claim that now is now is then at least used to express now is then false. And this is not very plausible to say that this is the result of some kind of re-evaluation um, for the following reason. If an expression type E is standardly used with a primary intention I, then I should be the conventional primary intention of E. That is the primary intention of E as an expression type. Otherwise, the conventional meaning of an expression would be completely disconnected from its use. And that would be kind of a strange um, consequence when it comes to how language use works. So for a standard world's account, this is problematic. According to such a conception of scenarios, the conventional primary intention of now picks out the time marked at the center of any given scenario. Yeah, this is um, not something a standard world's account can really give up. Hence, if the prime intention of the complex expression type now is now depends compositionality on the prime intention of its parts, then according to a standard world's account, it has a necessary prime intention. So the prime intention of now is now as an expression type in our language is necessary. And then to say that always when we use it, it gets re-evaluated and we express now as then forks would then lead to a complete disconnection between our use of a term and its standard meaning. And what I will show next is that um, the problem, a problem similar to the problem of a posterior truth also arises in the context of biconditionals. 
And we will see that revaluation is even more implausible when it comes to biconditionals. Um, and this will then further exacerbate the problem for advocates of Chalmers two-dimensional semantics. The starting point of the um, problem of biconditionals is um, Lee Bakuri and Hawthorne's um, Mirror Man example and its development by Speaks. So, Lee Bakuri and Hawthorne used the Mirror Man example to argue against the possibility of so called narrow content, that is, content that depends only on what is in the head of the speaker or thinker. And this would then also speak against the possibility of primary intention, which are a kind of narrow content. And the example is as follows. Mirror man is a left-right symmetrical human in, a, in an asymmetrical environment. And every thought he thinks with his left hemisphere has a corresponding thought in his right hemisphere. And mirror man has experiences as of two people who look like kid fine, one on his left and one on his right. With his left hemisphere, he thinks kid one is human. With his right hemisphere, he has a symmetrical thought, kid two is human. And in fact, the one on his left is human. So the first thought is true. While the one on his right is a wax work, so the second thought is false. Yeah. And prima facie, it seems that Chalmers two dimensional semantics cannot explain this, since mirror man's thoughts seem to share their primary intention. However, as Chalmers points out, the mirror man argument assumes a Lewis style centered world's account of narrow content, where indices are triples of worlds, individuals, and times, as we used it in the, when discussing our example with now is now. Hence, in order to block the mirror man argument, one could invoke more fine-grade indices, indices, such as experiences or fault tokens. Then one and the same primary intention could be assigned to kit one is human and kit two is human, which determines different truth values with respect to different fault involving indices. And this is what Lee Bakuri and Hawthorne call um, fault relativism. And the main dimensional alternative to fault relativism is what uh, Yil Bakuri and Hawthorne call quasi-internalism. Accordingly, the primary intention of a mental token such as kit may involve that very token. For example, the content of a token kit might be the entity that causes kit. Yeah. And we will now focus on fault relativism. Um, the problems are very, very similar. Against fault relativism speaks objects that while the fault token T3 is a priori to, the fault token T4 is not. Yeah. And prima facie fault relativism cannot explain this. After all, according to fault relativism, T3 and T4 seem to have the same primary intention. Yeah. But as speaks point out, a similar problem arises in connection with time relativism. And these problems now will look very similar to the problem uh, which I presented. Um, according to Speaks, uh, the primary intention of Amelia is happy determines different true files with respect to different time revolving indices. For example, while the fault uh, token T5 is a priori true, the fault token T6 is not. Yeah. And so, what Speaks wants to point out that. Um, this problem that uh, Vakuri and Hawthorne present is not very sp specific to for, for fault relativism, but also arises in connection with time relativism. And according to Speaks, the solution is also very obvious, at least in connection with time relativism. It is to hold fixed the times to which parts of T5 and T6 respectively are indexed when evaluating the fault with respect to a scenario. And since all the parts of T5 are indexed at the same time, T5 will be true at every scenario and thus will come out a priori. The parts of T6, on the other hand, are not indexed to the same times, which is why T6 won't be true at every scenario and hence won't come out a priori. And this suggests that the similar solutions are also available to fault relativism. Yeah. However, the problem is that their T3 consists of two different tokens of kit one is human, just like T4 consists of two different tokens at the left and the right hand side of the biconditional. So hence neither T3 nor T4 would come out as a priori if we had fixed the fork tokens to which parts of T3 and T4 are indexed when evaluating the forks with respect to a scenario. And the same would be true of the what seems to be a, a priori T7. And Chalmers um, tries to solve this problem by using indices involving four types instead of four tokens. So accordingly, the parts of T3 and T7 are respectively indexed to the same four type, 
While the parts of T4 are not explaining why T3 and T4, unlike T4, why T3 and T7, unlike T4, are a priori too. And something very similar can be said here in connection with um, quasi-internalism, which I won't mention. Um, and we will, which would then uh, result in that quasi-internalism can provide similar explanations of the fact that T3 and T7 are a priori, while T4 is not. And although both fault relativism and quasi-internalism seem to provide an explanation of the fact that unlike T4, T3, and T7 are a priori true, the problem for time relativism can be further exacerbated using the time machine example. For example, while T5 seems to be a priori true, T8 is not when produced by our speaker in the time machine example. And note in the time machine example, um, even T8, um, both the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the biconditional are produced at the same time. Yeah. So this is, a this is the difference to Speak's example. So even in the above variant of the time relativist view cannot explain this, which helps the times uh, to which the indexical sentences, uh, to which the um, sentences at the left and the right hand side of the biconditional are indexed fixed. After all, both the parts of T5 and the parts of T8 are indexed to the same times. Yeah. So just like T5, T8 should be a priori according to time relativism. A possible solution would be um, to index the parts of T5 and T8 to times without fixing them. Yeah, so what speaks does, he fixes the times, but we could try to not fix them. But then the problem is obvious, neither T8 nor T5 should then be a priori. And prima facie, we would say that at least T5 is a priori. But as we saw in connection with uh, a posteriori true um, utterance of now is now, there we also had the consequence that every true utterance of now is now is a posteriori true because Mary has to rule out the scenario that she sits in a real time machine. And why not say the same thing here? Yeah. So why not say, well, yeah, then ultimately T5 and T8 are both a posteriori true if true. And this could then be compared to the explanation offered in connection with a posteriori true utterance of now is now. Again, an advocate of Chalmers through dimensional semantics could argue that since even an agent who perused a biconditional fork, such as T5, has to rule out the possibility that they sit in a real time machine in order to know that the fork is true. Yeah. And therefore, biconditional, biconditional forks such as T5 are indeed a posteriori true if true. Nevertheless, it seems that there are a priori true biconditional forks. One such example is provided by the mirror example itself. Let us assume that Mirrorman thinks the fork Derek Parfit is popular with his left and with his right hemisphere at the same time. Then they should be in a position to know a priori that the respective biconditional fork T9 is true. Yeah. Hence, when evaluating T9 with respect to the scenario, the times of its parts would have to be fixed. So we see that we sometimes would have to say that the times to which the parts are indexed have to be fixed to explain that the sentences are a priori, and sometimes we would have to say that they are not fixed. But uh, this is not something we can simply stipulate. Um, so this shows that neither fixing nor unfixing the times to which parts of a fault are indexed provides a complete solution of the problem of biconditional faults. Uh, because in the end, some seem to be a priori and some seem to be a posteriori. A final possibility would be to use indices involving fault tokens instead of indices involving times, also in connection with time relativism. Similarly, quasi-internalists could use prime intentions involving fault tokens, such as the time of the fault token T, is such that what caused the token of type T is popular. So we have then get something quite complicated. Um, so this um, T9 um, star, would then be what the primary intention of T9 is. And this would indeed provide an explanation of the fact that Mirror Man is in a position to know a priori that T9 is true. After all, Mirror Man can know by introspection that left and right hemisphere produce the respective fork tokens at the same time. However, since the parts of both T5 and T8 would be indexed to different fork tokens, 
Such a solution would again be committed to the claim that ultimately neither T8 nor T5 is a priori. But this, this could be something we, we, we uh, are ready to accept. But even if we accept this, yeah, ultimately um, such a solution is also not without problems, as a variant of the Derek Parfit example shows with Mirror Man. So let us assume that an agent observes Mirror Man's thoughts using a device that allows them to observe the minds of others. Then such an agent is still in a position to know a priori that T9 is true. Yeah. However, since the agent uses a device that allows them to observe what goes on in the mind of Mirror Man, the agent is not in a position to know a priori that Mirror Man's left hemisphere produced a token T um, at the same time as Mirror Man's right hemisphere produced a token T prime. Rather, they know this as a result of empirical observations. But then the fact that the agent can know a priori that T9 is true cannot be explained by the fact that T9 has a primary intention aching to T9 prime here. And this in turn suggests that Chalmers two-dimensional semantic does not have the resources to explain both that T9, something like T9 is a priori, and that um, T8 is um, a posteriori. So to conclude, the natural solution to the problem of indexicality according to Chalmers, that is the question how scenarios could best represent locating information, is to identify scenarios with centered worlds, or the tuples of worlds, individuals, times, and places. And a corollary of such a conception of uh, scenarios is that two arbitrary tokens of now have the same prime intention, picking out the time marked at the center of any given scenario. And however, this seems to be incompatible with the fact that an utterance of now is now is a posteriori true if true. Suggesting that an advocate of Chalmers two-dimensional semantic has to come up with an alternative candidate for scenarios, which then has to provide an explanation of both the problem of indexicality and the problem of a posteriori truth presented in this talk. Since identifying scenarios with centered world seems to be the natural solution to the problem of indexicality, this is no easy task. And as we saw in the last section, a similar problem also arises in the context of biconational forks, further undermining um, Chalmers' um, two-dimensional semantics. Thank you. Thank you.